All right, so first of all, thank you so much for, uh, um, of course, including our paper in the program, but uh, even you know, more importantly for organizing this, uh, this great initiative and for like, you know, bringing structural transformation and economic growth at, at the center. So this is a joint work with um, uh, Vittorio, Raffaella, Ritwik, and Esau. Uh, Vittorio is, uh, is here uh, today and he is uh, gonna kind of like, you know, manage the chat if there are like some questions that come up. So the uh, premise of our work are really like three facts uh, um, about firms uh, in developing countries. Uh, firms are small, there are many of them uh, in the same sectors and they tend to like, you know, operate side by side in informal clusters. Now these three key facts can be clearly seen uh, in this picture um, that the um, kind of plot data from Uganda, which is the setting of our study. So what we do here, like each one of these dots is uh, a sector. And uh, on the x-axis uh, is a three-digit sector. On the x-axis, we plot the average firm size. And on the y-axis, uh, we plot essentially a measure of uh, firm density that captures how many firms are operating side by side. So I can be more specific. What we do is for every firm in the sector, we draw a 500 meter uh, circle, like a radio, uh, sorry, a circle of 500 meters radius around it. And then we count, because we have GPS location, how many firms in the same sector are within uh, the circle. What we can see from this figure is that there are like, you know, firms tend to be small. Um, so look at like, you know, most sectors uh, are in this part here where the average firm size is between one and four, and four. However, there are many firms operating side by side. So look at carpentry, this dot here. There are 16 other firms in carpentry within like you know, walking distance. All right, so why am I showing you this, uh, this uh, figure and these three facts? Because in this paper, we are gonna argue that these facts are very important if you want to understand the firm level decisions to adopt technology. And we're gonna talk about one specific case of technology adoption. We're gonna focus uh, on technology which is embodied into large invisible capital input. So you can think of uh, a um, firm that in order to like, you know, upgrade the uh, technology, upgrade the capital stock has to buy a large, uh, a large machine. Now, the first fact was that firms are small. And so this is like, you know, as very well known, it can be a problem because essentially firms don't have a sufficiently large scale. They may um, be kind of like trapped in some poverty trap because they don't have the scale to make this like indivisible investment. Think of it as to purchase a machine. Okay, and this is well known. It is in fact like, you know, this hypothesis is at the center of like some of the literature on financial fiction. However, we've shown like, you know, these facts two and three. And uh, so th that is kind of like you know, really the, the, the novel part that we focus on. And we are going to kind of like, you know, argue that is important because while a firm in isolation may not have the scale to kind of make the indivisible investment, the cluster as a whole may be sufficiently large. So in other words, the indivisibility may bind at the firm level, but not at the cluster level. Okay. And really kind of our contribution in this paper is to show that this second perspective, so shifting like the focus from a firm to the group of firm, to understand technology adoption is important. Why? Because we are going to show that uh, the presence of many firms like uh, side by side allows them essentially to adopt technology through a rental market for machines. To be more concrete, we are going to show that like, you know, one firm buys the machine, but this machine is too large for a single individual firm, and then the firm can rent out some of the capacity to the other firms nearby. And really the basic idea is extremely simple. It is that while one machine is indivisible, which again can be a problem, generate poverty trap and so on and so forth, the capacity or the time that you utilize a machine instead can be shared by other firms within the cluster. So just to kind of give you like a brief overview of what's, what's to come, the paper has three parts. In the first part, we design a new survey and then we use it to collect data on more than 1,000 manufacturing firms in urban Uganda. We are gonna focus on three like large manufacturing sectors. And within each sector, uh, and for every firm, what we do it is we try really to collect the information on the entire production process. So think of it as uh, rather than only measure as usually done in survey, how much a firm produces, we measure how a firm produces, the exact kind of like, you know, process. We then use this like, you know, very rich data to document some fact to describe how production happened and is organized in these sectors. In particular, we're going to document a couple of like, you know, key things. We're going to show that there are economies of scale, which are generated by these like, large capital equipment. Again, think of it as like, you know, machines. I'll show you some pictures. 
but also we show that there is like, you know, a, a rental market between firms that allow them to share machines. So as, I, as I mentioned the slide before, one firm buys the machine and then rents out the excess capacity to the others. We then complement um, this empirical analysis uh, with uh, um, a model. We're gonna write down a model which is really kind of like motivated and tied to the data that we show. It's gonna be like a fairly simple model of like firm technology adoption and rentals subject to some like reduced form friction. And we use it for three things. First, as like a measuring tool to really understand how large are the frictions in the rental market. Then second, as kind of like to do some quantification and to show what are the aggregate impact of the presence of the rental market and the way of uh, it, it functions in our setting that is like in urban Uganda. But then also like, you know, while our paper is a case study, we hope that we are gonna draw like some broader kind of lessons and we use the model to do that. To go a little bit like, you know, beyond Uganda and try to understand why in our setting rental market is important, which tell us in which other setting we expect the rental market to be important. And we are gonna show that uh, really the rental market uh, like is a substitute for other missing markets. And so essentially it is like, you know, more important. It has like, you know, bigger aggregate implications in the presence of other market imperfections. And so in that sense, we think that rental markets are important, especially for uh, developing countries that usually are like more plugged by market imperfection. And so that's it for the, for the introduction. If there are like, no, no, no questions that Victoria wants to take, let me just like uh, move on and start by describing the survey. So this is a map of Uganda. I'm showing you this map just to kind of like, you know, highlight these blue areas that are like all the areas where uh, we went with other enumerators and we did like you know, a complete census of all the firms in this area. So our survey is representative of the urban area uh, in like these three regions of, of Uganda, because pretty much all Uganda apart from the north, which is uh, really sparsely populated. Now, in terms of survey design, our kind of key innovation, it is to go at the product level and as I mentioned, to kind of like document the production process. So what do we do in practice? It is before going to the field, we spend a lot of time doing like, you know, focus group and talking with like, you know, industrial association to try to understand first, which ones are the key products that are produced in our sectors. And second, how our product is uh, produced. So here you can see, for example, like, you know, for uh, um, carpentry, the key product is uh, a two panel door. And uh, we, um, we kind of like, you know, found that in order to produce a two panel door, firms usually go through like, you know, this sequence of steps. And then again, like, you know, we pre-specified the steps, the product, but also for every steps, which type of machines firm can use. Okay, so we, we really like, you know, had like, you know, this catalog that describes how firms can produce in principle. And then we went to each firm and like, you know, using this catalog, we document for every step, how many hours of labor, which type of machines they use, how many hours they use each machines, and also like, you know, whether a step is mechanized or not, which I show you in a, in, a, in, a, in a second what it means. So mechanization, um, as, a, sorry, let me just take, do, do you see something popping up? Maybe, well, no one else, maybe you don't, I, okay, sorry. There was just like, you know, some alarm from my computer, apologize. Okay, so, um, step by step, uh, we went there, and uh, one of the key things which we can measure it is whether a firm is mechanized or not in a given step, which means whether a firm uses a production like modern machine, like what we see here, or instead like you know a, a manual a manual tool. So this is like the same step, which is planing. So you take a piece of wood and you just have to navigate it, and it can be done either with this like you know four thousand dollar machines that takes like a second and produces a very high quality piece of wood or manually with a manual planer that essentially just like, you know, pass on the wood and you go on and on for like, you no know, longer time and the final output is not, not the same. So again, for every step we know how a firm does it and also like, you know, how many hours uh, they use like, you know, given machines or, or they just, or they use labor. So we have this data and then what we do <clears throat> is uh, we, we use it to document some facts uh, on production. And, um, first, as already mentioned, you know, firms are organized in formal clusters. So you don't want to think of this one as like, you know, special economic zones or anything like, you know, formal. It's just essentially that uh, firms are like relocated side by side into some parts of the city where they are. Typical firm is small and there are many of them side by side. Now what is kind of more remarkable and novel is that, that these firms are tend to be like, you know, very similar to the extent that they produce the same products. So you remember the two panel door, essentially 70% of firms produce, uh, have produced one in the last three months. Also, there is no specialization across steps. 
which means that essentially firms uh, do like you know all the, the the steps which i've showed you before however there is heterogeneity in the sense that there is difference in capital intensity so some firms uh, do like a step with a modern machine and some others instead with manual, with manual tools we then document economies of scale so how do we do that well first we show that uh, being mechanized so using one of these large equipment um, generates productivity gains of course these are correlation not in causal uh, but both in terms of like you know speed we can measure the, the exact number of needles that it takes to kind of produce a door with different methods and also in terms of quality so we have measures of quality of the output so machines are good however they are very expensive so they essentially cost like uh, thickness spinner costs like 20 times like 20 monthly profit of a different of a typical firm and also they have very large capacity for a single firm so if you think of a typical firm, they use the machines for only 20 hours per week. So that means that it's not really worthwhile for one firm, given the size, to buy a machine by themselves because they just don't need it. We also show that there is heterogeneity. So some sectors uh, like carpentry have very important economies of scale. Instead, metal fabrication and grain milling um, in these two sectors, economies of scale are less important. Third, uh, but most importantly, we document the presence of these uh, you know, uh, very active uh, rental market uh, uh, interference for, uh, for large machines. Uh, let me show you that uh, in, in a bit more details in the next slide. So one way to see really how important the rental market is, uh, is to see how many firms use it to access machines. So what I'm showing you here, so this, um, I'm not sure if you can read, but these are just uh, you know, the names of all the different uh, um, machines that we uh, pre-specified. And so these are like drills and so on and so forth. And then for every one of these machines, we show here the number of firms in our sample that own uh, uh, one of these machines. So for example, if you look at like, you know, thickness planer, so this is the, the machine I showed you like before in the, in the picture, uh, less than 10% of the firm typically, um, like not typically, less than 10% of the firm actually own a thickness planer, okay? So from this picture, it seems that uh, machines are not very uh, well diffused in, in this market. However, the picture changes dramatically if we look at uh, firms that use machines, either because they own one or because they rent it. So again, focus on the thickness planer. Uh, less than 10% of the firms own one, but uh, almost 60% of firms use a thickness planer and all the ones that don't own it but use it, they use it to the rental market. So we have a lot of descriptives in, in the paper in which we describe uh, how the rental market works. There is one thing which is extremely important to keep in mind to understand like, you know, the, uh, the structure of the model and, and what's to come, is that uh, machines uh, are used at the owner premises. So if you remember again, this thickness planer, it's not that the thickness planer moves, uh, but they are like you know, firm owners that take their input. So think of it as like you take a panel of wood and then you travel to a firm that has a thickness planer, you wait in line for a little bit, and then you use it, and then you go back to your own firm. So this is important to keep in mind because uh, the way in which this is structured kind of um, generate uh, um, very naturally some like you know, transaction and time cost to actually access machine if you don't own it. As I mentioned, there are heterogeneity in economies of scale, which are larger in carpentry and kind of consistent with this, uh, we show that the rental market is uh, more important in carpentry than in metal fabrication and grain milling. And so for the rest of kind of like you know, the paper, now we're gonna focus on, on carpentry uh, for the rest of the presentation, sorry, in the paper we show also like you know more results for the other for the other two sectors. Now another way to kind of uh, gauge the importance of the rental market, um, it is to see the implication for firm size. So let me guide you through like you know what we are doing here. So first we have to start from just describing what firm size is, and so here um, in uh, in this plot we we kind of plot the the, the density of firm size when we define a firm as usually done, that is a firm is a manager. If you define a firm as a manager, so the boundary of a firm are, are, are given by like the manager's span of control, then you see that essentially almost all firms are like, you know, around five, like most of them are around like, you know, five employees and there are roughly like, you know, no firms bigger than employees in Uganda. So this is Uganda carpentry. However, like the presence of the rental market somehow like, you know, justifies us to think of a different notion of firm size. We can think of a, of a firm, not as a manager, but as a machine. 
And so we can think of a firm as essentially the set of workers that use the same machine. Okay, and then once we shift the boundaries of the firm in this way, we get this new firm distribution in black. And you see that it looks very different. So there are like you know, now way more firms like in the medium size, so between 10 and 20 employees. Okay, so again, like you know, here we are comparing a firm as a manager versus a firm as a machine. Now, of course, what the thinking of a firm as a machine makes sense depends on how frictional is the rental market. So it depends essentially on like how hard it is for a firm to access the machines to the rental market. So what we do next it is we're gonna write down a model which really is gonna kind of like you know help us understand whether this view of the world is meaningful or whether instead the frictions are so large that we should just still think of a firm as a manager. Now, before going to the model, I just want to advertise a little bit of results which are in the paper. So one of the things that we are really personally really excited about, about our work, it is that really like, you know, our model is grounded in empirical evidence. So all the assumptions are somehow like, you know, justified by very detailed data. And in particular, there are kind of like three blocks um, of like results that are important to see like, you know, why we write down the model that we write down. First, we see that there is not much like evidence for uh, economies of scale driven by labor. So no labor specialization across steps, for example. On the opposite, there seems to be evidence of labor market frictions. And in particular, that kind of like, you know, makes the cost of labor more expensive as a firm grows. So as the firm hires more workers. Then second, uh, we show that kind of, you know, the output market uh, um, seems to be like, you know, like seems to have like imperfect competition, which, which can be described by a CES. Why? Well, we document like differentiation of products. So we document like some output market frictions, which again, like, you know, can be described by a CES. We also show that the markup is similar across firms and not related to mechanization. Third and last, why like, you know, there's imperfect competition in the output market, the rental market seems to be like, you know, fairly competitive at least to the extent that the concentration of, of ownership is not that large, meaning that in every single area, there are usually like, you know, several different big machines. And also like, you know, once we look at prices, we see that actually the, the, the relative price of renting to owning for these like, you know, large machines is cheaper than for the small ones. And if you think of like a lot of market powers, you will expect the opposite because you will expect that the machines for which there is like, you know, harder kind of like larger barriers to entry, then firms should charge like you know higher higher uh, prices to then generate higher profit. Still, like a subject to friction, I already mentioned this. There are like you know transport and weight costs to, to access the machines. So, All right. one question, uh, Tommaso, can you explain the first item? It was not this uh, one. Not super clear to me. The weak link between yeah. size and absolutely. So let me click here actually. So what we do. So again, uh, I haven't really described the details, but like, you know, we know how like each workers, what uh, tasks they do within the firm. And so we can see, for example, whether for larger firms, so here on the X axis, we have like, you know, small and large firms. We can see whether in large firms there is more specialization. So maybe like in the firms that have 15 employees, one is specialized into planning and the other one only into like, you know, painting. And so what you see is that there is a little bit of specialization, but way less than expected uh, given kind of like, you know, the change in size. We also look whether large firms actually. Uh, you define expected as. Sorry. You define expected as. How you how you measure what is expected? Oh yeah, well, it is expected. It is like you know just given the number of steps and the number of workers. So think of it as like you know if you have full specialization. So this is like uh, this dotted line here is full specialization. So it's not that there is no specialization, but that there is like, you know, not that much given that you move from like, if you have a firm with only one employee, that employee must do all the steps. If you have a firm with like, you know, 15 employees and there are 15 steps, if you have full specialization, you will have like, you know, one employee per step. And so essentially what we show is that there is a little bit of a change in specialization, but not much uh, uh, given the differences in, in, in firm size. Another thing that we can do is like, you know, look at teamwork, so whether, if you have like you know many workers, you can do like a lot of teamwork. So you can put two or three workers at the same step together, which maybe also like you know helps. So we also see that that doesn't doesn't really happen. Again, this can be like a specific to our setting in the sense you know there is this a very nice AR paper by Rob Jensen showing that uh, uh, in both production and Kerala, uh, instead there is specialization of labor. Here we don't really see it because we don't see like you know strong evidence for it. Okay. Uh, let me jump into the model. 
so I just can describe the model in one slide uh, with, with no equations. And of course, there are like a bunch of equations in the paper and I can go over it if, if you have questions. So in the economy, the economy is inhabited by managers, which have this uh, um, managerial ability Z, which is just exogenous. Now, the first choice that the manager has to make, it is decide whether to enter and start producing or take an outside option that we estimate in the data. If a manager starts producing, so becomes a carpenter, then it's going to draw a cost of capital, which is uh, this row here, which essentially um, modulates how costly it is to make this capital investment, so think of it to buy a machine. The managers make two uh, production choices. They have to decide whether they want to mechanize or not. So they want to use a ticket explainer or they want to only rely like on labor and manual tools. That's the first choice. And this is going to depend on managerial ability because we build in some complementarity between mechanization and, and managerial ability. And it's going to depend on how more productive the mechanized production process is, these days AM, and also the kind of quality boost. So we allow the production process to like improve the quality and that is this mu. Also, it's going to depend on the labor market friction. Why? Because essentially firms can kind of like, you know, increase the size of a firm and produce more, either through hiring like, you know, more laborers or like, you know, more capital. And the labor market friction essentially modulates how costly it is to just like increase the size of the firm through labor. The other choice managers make it is they have to decide whether they want to invest or not. So do they want to buy the machine or not? This is going to depend on raw, which is their cost of capital, which of course, like, you know, affects how cost it is to, to buy a machine on the relative price to buy and rent machines, and on tau, which is this rental market wedge, which essentially is just like an iceberg cost that uh, uh, multiplies the price of renting machines. So if you decide to rent, you have to pay not only the rental price, but also this tau, which is a key object which you're gonna estimate in the data. Now these two production choices essentially partition managers into groups. And two key groups are the one that are the machine lenders. So are individuals that uh, like managers that decide to like, you know, own a machine and they're going to use some of the machine for themselves, but also some of the capacity of the machine they're going to supply to the rental market. And then the renters, which are instead the managers that want to mechanize, but do not own a machine themselves. There are also like, you know, the typical uh, intensive margin choices. So, all managers have to choose like, you know, how much hours of capital and labor and, they're gonna, and that is gonna determine the output. And managers face uh, like a CS a demand structure, kind of like, you know, very standard and production functions are covered areas. Now this is an equilibrium model. And in particular, there is going to be like an equilibrium in the rental market. So like total amount of capacity supplied of machine time has to be equal to the capacity of machines like demanded by the renters. And so that's gonna determine this rental market price PR. And also there is like, you know, equilibrium in the output market, uh, which is fairly standard. It's going to be like a firm specific um, uh, price of this differentiated product. And then there is like, you know, an aggregate uh, uh, carpentry, carpentry price. So that's the model. Uh, now to kind of like you know, build a bit of intuition of really like uh, how, how this economy works, I'm going to show you some comparative statics um, as we vary this rental market wedge, which is kind of this, this key object, which essentially modulates the friction in, in the rental market. So let's start from a frictionless world when tau is equal to zero. So there are like, essentially there is like, you know, no transaction cost to access machines to the rental market. In this world, uh, and then what we look at is we look at investment and mechanization as a function of the two dimensional heterogeneity, which is uh, raw cost of capital and managerial ability. Now in this uh, frictionless benchmark, investment and mechanization are completely separate. And we have that uh, the managers which have like, you know, a low cost of capital. So below a given cutoff, they're gonna invest, they're gonna buy the machine. And the managers that have instead a high return from capital, hence that they have a high ability, uh, they're gonna mechanize. Okay, two choices completely separate. Now what we do next, it is uh, let's take uh, the mechanization choice, the argument is symmetric for investment, and let's see how it varies as we change this tau. The key is that tau really ties together investment and mechanization choices. So to see it, let me like, you know, do like, look at like some groups of managers. So for example, consider managers in, in this part here of the space. So they have fairly high ability, but also they have a high cost of capital. Now, 
in a fictional world, um, they were mechanizing to the rental market. They were not buying the machine themselves. They were just accessing to the rental market. If you increase Tau, it becomes for them relatively more expensive to access machines. Hence, some of them on the margin are going to decide not to mechanize them more. On the opposite, instead, some managers that are not as skilled, but have a low cost of capital, now are going to decide to mechanize. Why? Well, because now for them, the opportunity cost essentially of like, you know, using the machine themselves rather than renting it out to others is, is lower because the rental market uh, uh, function less well. And really, so here you kind of like see how like increasing the tau is really like tying together these two choices and somehow like, you know, generating misallocation between the people that actually um, invest, uh, which in the first best are the one that have a low cost of capital and the one that mechanize, so use capital, which are the one that should have like a high return from it. The two choices become tied together. Okay, so we have the model. Now we bring it to the data. We like extend the model a little bit to make it amenable to estimation. In particular, we have like, you know, some fresh shocks to smooth out the choices, the discrete choices. And then also we add like a sector of specialized lenders because we see that in the data, there are some firms that only specialize in lending they don't produce. And once we have this like a rich model, we do like a mix of estimation and calibration uh, to pin down the parameters. Let me show, since it is like one of the key parameters, exactly how we pin down the rental market wedge, and then I'll describe a little bit more the estimation procedure. Now, the, uh, the model provides us kind of like, you know, an extremely like uh, useful, like, you know, results so that is uh, that the tau essentially modulates the gap in the marginal cost of capital between renters and owners. Why? Because renters have to pay the price times one plus tau, as mentioned. And instead, for owners, the marginal cost of capital is simply the opportunity cost of renting out. Therefore, we have like, you know, a, a simple lemma that shows that the capital labor ratio of renters relative to owners is decreasing in tau. In other words, if there is a, a, like, a, um, a market wedge, then we would expect the renters to use a little bit like, you know, to be less capital intensive than, than owners. So what we can do, we can just like, you know, run this regression in, in, uh, in the data in which we have like on the left hand side at the firm step level, the capital labor ratio. Then we have like, you know, a lot of rich controls. We actually even have like, you know, firm fixed effects. So we can compare the same firm across different steps, whether they own or they rent the machine. And then the key variable of interest is this uh, dummy rent, which is equal to one if a firm uh, rents a machine rather than own it. And if tau is positive, we'll expect this beta one to be negative because we will expect renters to um, use like, you know, relatively less capital uh, with respect to labor. So what do we find? So focus here on the first column. Indeed, the beta is negative, okay? It's minus 0 0.35. So what does that mean? It means that uh, the implied tau is 43, 43%. So to, what does that number mean? It means that for every dollar, that you spend to like rent uh, um, one hour of machine, uh, you have to spend like you know, on top of it 40 cents in transaction cost. So this initially seemed like a little bit high to us. So then what we did is like we went back and like, you know, we collect measures on exactly like, you know, how costly it is to go use this machine. So we look at the transport cost, we know how they access the machines, whether they, they pay for like a, a boda, which is like a motorcycles, how long they waited and so on and so forth. And once we can like, you know, account for this direct cost, we arrive at the 60% of the wedge, which kind of like, you know, for us, it was like, you know, very important because it means that this, this number seems to be like, you know, at least uh, um, in the same order of magnitude that's the direct evidence on, on cost. We do like a lot of kind of robustness checks around it since this is like such an important uh, parameters. This is just a specification plot. We want to show you that our uh, favorite estimate is like you know, pretty much in the middle of, of the range. So as I mentioned, there is uh, like, you know, the rest we do like estimation. So don't want you to kind of like, you know, look at all the details in this table. I just want to say that we have 17 parameters. We target 23 moments. The fit of the model is good. Not surprising because we have a lot of flexibility. What is more interesting, it is kind of like how we identify each one of these parameters. We just like, you know, give you, um, I'm running a bit out of time. So let me just give you like, you know, one, one example of how we can really use our data to kind of pin down the parameters. So a key parameter is this new, which is the, the, the size of the labor market friction. So we estimate fairly sizable labor market friction. So what 15% means, uh, one way to look at that number, it is that essentially two thirds of the overall decreasing return in the economy are generated by labor market frictions. 
And so how we do, do we get that? Well, because we know the relationship between a firm output and the firm size and the firm capital. And essentially, like, you know, the stronger the labor market frictions, the more firms are gonna grow, increasing the capital stock rather than increase uh, the number of workers. So that is how, like one of the moments that allows us to pin down no. Another kind of key parameters is this, uh, this empirical correlation between the cost of capital and the managerial ability that modulates the return of capital. And we see that this is negative. So this is important because it means that essentially there's not gonna be a lot of misallocation because the, the high ability managers also have a low, um, a low cost of capital. Again, lots more like in the paper, we, do, we discussed a lot of identification of each one of these parameters. Uh, I refer to that or we can discuss more after, after I'm done with the presentation. All right, so we have a model, we estimated it, now let's use it uh, to kind of like learn a little bit uh, of how the rental market works and, and, and whether it matters. The first thing we do is we just wanna compute the aggregate effects of the rental market. To do that, what we do it is essentially we take our estimated economy and we just uh, um, kind of like keep all the parameters constant and then just vary the, the size of this wedge from a world where the wedge is so large that essentially no one rents to a world where the wedge is zero, hence a frictionless rental market. And then we compute a bunch of aggregate statistics. So here I'm showing you mechanization. So mechanization increases from going to no rental market to frictionless rental market by 170%. Okay, so that means that there are like, you know, very large potential gains from having like a, a frictionless rental market. Uh, labor productivity also increases a lot, not as much. And the reason is that uh, when the rental market functions well, you bring in a lot of kind of like, you know, marginal managers, which are like very like small firms, so they don't really contribute a lot to aggregate productivity. So now these are the potential gains. How about the actual gains of our rent? rental market. Well, this like a, a vertical line here shows our estimated value of tau of 43%. What is important is that our estimated economy reaps more than half of the overall potential gains of the rental market. So in that sense, we say that firms do achieve scale collectively in the sense that this rental market like, you know, allows them relative to no rental market to size a lot of like you know, the potential gains. And so if you remember back this comparison, which I did in the empirical part between thinking of a firm as a machine or a firm as a manager, well, given this result, we think that thinking of a firm as a machine is not, is not that, uh, that crazy. At least like, you know, it, is, it is kind of like meaningful. So I show you the aggregate. Let me show you a little bit of like, you know, what's happening in the micro data to really understand where the gains are coming from. So one useful thing is to look at the mechanization decision as a function of the two dimensions of heterogeneity, which is managerial ability and interest rate. So what I'm showing you here, so this is kind of like, you know, output from the model, the share of managers that mechanize, like, you know, the partial distribution is a function of like their ability. So you can see that, you know, more able managers are more likely to mechanize. And that's true for like, you know, two reasons. First, because uh, um, they are gonna have a higher return from mechanization, but also because in our estimated model, they have a lower cost of capital. And here, what I'm showing you now, this is like the case with no rental market. So this is like mechanization choice, if uh, you have to buy a machine to mechanize. You can see this very clearly on the right hand side because here we show mechanization as a function of the interest rate and you see that if the interest rate, so this is the cost of capital is very large, no one mechanizes it. Why? Because it's just too expensive, it's not worthwhile. Now let's, uh, let's change and let's uh, take our estimated economy and look at mechanization in the frictionless case. So when tau is equal to zero. Now you see, first you see that there's like a shift up. Now like, you know, way more managers mechanize, both low and high ability. And why that's happening? Well, because uh, essentially now like managers can uh, just share the machine. So even for the same number of machine, many people can access it. On the right figure here, you show that uh, there is an increase in mechanization for the low interest rate, but uh, in particular, there is like you know, a massive increase for the high interest rate, which now they can access machines to the rental market. And really these pictures holds off, um, hopefully um, like highlighted a little bit uh, kind of the two key um, reasons why the rental market generates aggregate gains. The first one it is because it allows to overcome the indivisibility again by letting firms share machine. So it is as if firm size increases. And the second one is because it really like, you know, unbundles ownership and utilization of capital. You can see this clearly here, right? In no rental market, uh, you have to own to use it. So if you have a high cost of capital, you don't use it. 
frictionless rental market that you are unbundled, you can use capital even if for you it's very costly. So in this sense, the rental market really functions similarly to a financial market. Another thing that we, we can see it is that for both reasons, uh, the rental market favors relatively low ability managers because they are the one that have a higher cost of capital in our calibration. And also because uh, since they are small, they are the ones that are more likely to access capital to, to the rental market. Hence, the rental market has distributional effects. All right, so we do like a, a lot in the paper to kind of really show the importance of having a G model. I don't want to go into the details, but I just want to kind of give the main message. So what we show it is that in our setting, if you do like a partial equilibrium kind of intervention where you reduce the rental market wedge and then you look at the firm level at the impact on firm productivity and mechanization, you will grossly overestimate the true effect in general equilibrium. Why? Because there are like, you know, general equilibrium forces such as like, you know, prices essentially that adjust the dump and aggregate effect. So this is super important, like, you know, even given the team of, uh, um, of this workshop, because this is like, you know, one case where evidence by itself, even if like, you know, causal and perfect, it's not enough to do like policy recommendation because we really need to take into account the equilibrium effect. All right, so in the, in the rest of the time, let me just like, you know, go a little bit uh, beyond uh, our setting and uh, what we do essentially is we have done a case study but we want hopefully to like you know, draw some broader lessons and one way to do it is using our model to study really like in which context we expect the rental market to be important and why so how do we do it well we recompute like you know the gains from the rental market and the share of managers that access machines to rentals as we vary the strength of other frictions we show you just one we vary the labor market friction. So I showed you that like in our benchmark, they're fairly large. If you think of an economy, which is identical on any other dimension, but has no labor market frictions, then the share of renters will decrease by 30% relative to the benchmark. Why that's the case? Well, without labor market frictions, firms have an easier time kind of like, you know, growing and hence uh, they have sufficiently large scale to buy the machine rather than access it through the rental market. Now, this is a more general point that uh, um, the rental market is kind of like has larger gains uh, when there are other uh, market imperfections and so as already mentioned in the introduction this is the reason why we think that rental markets are especially important in developing countries and uh, can be kind of like in you know, a useful uh, um, a way again to attenuate the aggregate impact of other level market imperfections so i left the literature for the end uh, because uh, you know first i wanted to kind of show you exactly what we did so we think that we touch upon like, you know, three broad literature. For sure, the literature on financial frictions, I already mentioned, like we document evidence uh, uh, of, uh, of the importance of indivisible investment, but we also argue that rental markets are a viable tool to kind of attenuate the cost from financial frictions. We also touch upon the literature on firm size distribution in developing countries. So there is this famous result that there are like, you know, no um, middle size and large size firm in developing countries. Well, what we say it is that once you redraw the firm boundaries, uh, and once you realize that firm boundaries are not as kind of rigid as we previously thought, we kind of find back some of these missing uh, medium-sized firms. And third, we think we contribute to the literature on agglomeration because essentially we provide direct evidence for one source of agglomeration, which is like interactions in the physical uh, market for capital. So there is like you know, a very thriving literature that looks at interaction in ideas. Um, here we have something like, you know, way more like, you know, back to basics to just like, you know, interactions in the, in the market for capitals can generate economies of agglomeration. I'm running out of time, let me conclude. So what we have done in this project, a new survey and then a model to interpret the data with the overarching goal of like studying the role of economies of scale and visibility for development. In our set, we have two key results. We document this like, you know, active rental market, which is uh, crucial for firms to access machines. And then we do like, you know, to the model, we show that uh, this rental market has large aggregate and distributional effect. More broadly, we kind of like learn three lessons. The first one is that rental markets can attenuate the cost of other market imperfection. Then second is that, uh, again, once you, once you look and you take into account this interaction between firms, you can shift the boundaries of the firm and find back some of these like, you know, missing medium firms. And then third and broader, we think it's very important to kind of like shift focus from the individual firm to the cluster of firms. For sure, if you want to understand technology adoption, as in our example, but possibly even like, you know, broader, 
And so like, you know, something that we plan to do like in the, you know, coming months and years, it is study a little bit more like, you know, how these informal cluster of firms really are created, how they function, why like, you know, the competition effect uh, uh, that firms may suffer from like, you know, being side by side are uh, like, kind of compensated by the gains from economies of agglomerations, or maybe there's not that much competition because as in like, you no know, Joe, uh, work there are uh, instead kind of like you know collusion anyway i'm like out of time so i stop here thanks so much all right thanks tomaso um so for everyone else um we're happy to take questions now um you can either use the uh, raise hand function or you can type uh, uh questions and uh if you have a question um you just speak up if you are able to do so as well, as well um or type your question to the chat box can, can i ask a question I mean, I'm going to break. Let me see if anybody else out there. Uh, thanks, Tomas. So uh, I, I was thinking, so you have a, a, a setup with 10 firms and, and all alike. I can see the, 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 the algorithm is very clear that they can be different between each other. I mean, they will be better by, by buying, uh, by renting each of them from a single machine. Uh, but what, what if what the efficient uh, the efficient outcome should be that only one f one manager is in charge, uh, and the only way to do that is is him owning the machine and maybe getting all the other nine uh, individuals to work working for him and and his productivity being applied to his machine and all the workers. So. You, you, in that example, it seems to be hard to substitute from 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 the direct ownership. Yeah, it was so more me, like allow for that, and it wasn't. You think about the yeah, yeah. So this is a super important question, um, and uh, so my my answer is like you know somehow like disappointing, uh, in the sense that uh, um, in the model uh, we still so like your one way to rephrase your question is to say why firms don't consolidate the first best seems to be that like you know the more productive manager essentially expand hires everyone else and you have like you know, one big firm so in the model firm consolidation is not allowed and essentially like you know in order for kind of the model to to hit the data we need to have like you know very large heterogeneity managerial ability and you know, we need to have decreasing return so there are like you know forces in the model that essentially prevents firms from like, you know, growing, growing too large. And so this is completely kind of like, you know, exogenous. And the reasons why uh, that's happening, uh, somehow like, you know, we, we don't know yet. Uh, one possibility is that there are like, you know, frictions in the output market. So we document that uh, um, firms tend to sell output extremely locally. So maybe there are frictions that, you know, like you sell to like your social circle, you sell side by side because it's very costly to kind of expand because then you don't have customers anymore this is like you know, one possibility uh, but you know honestly that is kind of like you know building next door to the model and that is something that we're planning to explore more something which i will say it is that of course the cost of not consolidating are small in the presence of the rental market so if you think that there are like you know any type of like you know organizational barrier of any other reasons why firms like you know don't grow then the presence of a rental market actually can be even like, you know, bad in a dynamic sense because uh, it uh, makes it less costly for firms not to consolidate. And so this is like something else that we also would like to know that is understanding a little bit like, you know, the dynamics of the rental market. If firms start renting and then they own, do instead, the rental market just allows all these kind of like, you know, parasite firms to be alive and instead the real first best would be for the firms to exit. So all, all of these questions are extremely like, you know, interesting and we honestly don't have answers yet. But you know, hopefully like, you know, in the future, so we're planning to like, you know, collect more data, looking at like, you know, dynamics of firm in the setting and hopefully we're going to be able to, to say a little bit more. Uh, by the way, Vittorio, I've seen that there is like, you know, 18 questions in the chat. Is there anything that you would like to kind of like, you know, bring up? Uh, uh... Anything that they... Uh, yeah, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mute everybody that, that that is not in the in the panel that has questions in case you want to jump. That they, they, they were asking a question in case they want to jump for clarification. So I think thank you. I think I I, I think now I've answered them. But um, if anyone that I answered to would like to you know um, just just elaborate more on some of these points, I think there were there were some very interesting questions asked in the chat. Um, 
So now if anybody wants, you know, of, of the people that ask a question wants, would like to elaborate a bit more or ask a follow-up questions related to, to my answers, I'd be happy to uh, answer now. This is, this is Tristan. I mean, I, I just hey. sort of building on what Rocco's question was and, and my own, it, it, you know, it, you, you look at a specific context, which is carpentry and kind of a, an urban area. And so it would be nice just to understand a bit more what are the industries or sectors in which this wouldn't work, uh, maybe because of the underlying economics, and then back that into, okay, you know, how much of, you know, an economy's uh, capital accumulation could be, could be some, you know, accounted for by having a rental market, um, just, just to sort of bring it, you know, to a more macro level. Um, I, I don't know, like, where, where would this fail, I guess, and why? Yeah, so again, like you know, interesting, interesting, super interesting question. So we, we can say a little bit, um, but I think we also, but we also plan to collect like you know, more data to say more. But so what we can say right now uh, is first of all, what makes the rental market successful? You need many firms nearby, and that you need firms to use similar machines. So you need like you know a setting where machines are not specialized at all. And so in, in our particular case, that's exactly it because firms produce very, very similar product and literally like, you know, there is a limited set of machines that, that, firms, that firms need. Um, that is uh, uh, not necessarily gonna extrapolate to different, uh, um, uh, to, to different uh, industries, but also not to different stages of development because as uh, kind of like, you know, countries develop, uh, then maybe products and firms become more specialized and they need their own machines. And so like, you know, something like the rental market doesn't, doesn't really like work. Another key thing it is, uh, and, and that again is something which, uh, you know, it's, it's a technological feature that we treat it as exogenous in the model is, but maybe is endogenous itself. It is the, 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 the capacity utilization of a given machine. So here we have like a setting where given the output that a typical firm produces, they really don't need to use a machine for more than 10, 15, 20 hours per week. That doesn't have to be necessarily the case. And in fact, like, you know, even within our, our um, sectors, there is some heterogeneity. So if you look at welding, uh, they use like, you know, the welder essentially like, you know, the, is their core machine and they don't really like, you know, share it much, but why? Because essentially they use it like, you know, almost full time. And also because like, you know, it's cheaper. So that is like, you know, the other key elements it is that in machines, which, you know, like there are transaction costs to share them. So you need machines that are sufficiently expensive relative to like, you know, the firm, the firm profitability. And so even again, like here, we can say something with our data. So we have like, you know, a portfolio of different machines and we see that like drills, which are a hundred dollars are not as likely to be rented. Not surprising, right? You know, because there are gonna be some transaction costs. It's not worthwhile for a drill. The expensive machines like a ticket spinner is way more likely to be rented. So again, there's like heterogeneity. Right now, we only have data from this sector, so we can just like you know extrapolate and 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 guess. But something that you know um, funding permitting, hopefully, will do it is like uh, do like you know some survey like you know many different sectors, uh, try to understand whether like you know how generalized uh, the rental market is, uh, um, where it functions, where it doesn't function, and so on and so on and so forth. So, you know, again, unfortunately, like I'm also answering with, you know, promise of future data, but uh, uh, that's what we can say right now. Can you hear me? I had a question. Yeah, sure, Christina. Uh, super cool, uh, super cool paper. Thanks for presenting. So the question was whether you have explored, to what extent have you explored the data on the existing owned machines? What is their utilization rate? The reason I'm asking because if there is potentially heterogeneous utilization rate in space, then even conditional on the existing machines, um, you could figure out if you could get higher efficiency overall in the rental market just by reallocating um, in space one machine to some central location such that more firms uh, get to use it. And I guess that could give you also an idea of what are the components of the of the frictions um, that you that you that you measure so nicely. That's super interesting. Uh, um, that we can do it, but we haven't done it. So what I can tell you is that we we look at heterogeneity in capacity utilization across machine type, and there is luck. So like even for like expensive machines like the thickness spinner, there is still like you know thirty percent is luck, which kind of suggests that. Uh, 
there are some type of coordination frictions, which by the way, we document because we show that, you know, there are often like, you know, weights, we look at the time, everyone goes like to use a thickness pen in the morning. So if you go in the afternoon, no one is there, but like everyone wanna like use it in the morning and so they wait in line. So we have evidence for these kind of coordination frictions. We do, we know that there is luck. Slack is much larger for like, you know, smaller, cheaper machines, kind of like as expected. Uh, it, it reaches like, you know, as much as 50 to 60%. But we haven't done it, uh, what to suggest, that is looking at whether the slacking capacity varies across space. Uh, and so that is actually honestly something that we, we have the data to do it and, and we can do it, but we, we just haven't done it. Unless like, you know, Vittorio, uh, you, you checked at some point, you haven't, we haven't, right? Uh, no, I don't think we have. Okay, yeah. Just, just want to be sure. Okay, Hannes. Uh, yes. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I had an identification question, um, which is about the tau. So, if I understand correctly, the identification of the tau works that we look at how the capital labor ratio changes as a function of renting or not, and then yeah. essentially use Cobb Douglas to sort of translate that percentage decrease into a wedge, uh, one for one. And I guess that sort of raised the question. I mean. Of course, your parameters are much better calibrated than most other models I see, but I guess you give a lot, then you ask for a lot. Uh, so I just try to think about like how to justify a Cobb Douglas assumption by task and whether there might be some possibility maybe to use variation across locations which have very different capital costs, just to see roughly whether the, the factor share is constant, for example, in different localities uh, or, or, or something similar. Uh, because it feels like a crucial mapping to actually get that number right. So it would be just interesting to think about like exactly what, how, to, how to do that. Yeah, no, that's fair. Honestly, that's fair. Um, yeah, yeah. so, you know, like what, what kind of like justified us a little bit, but it's like a very partial uh, kind of like, you know, answer. It is that if you look at like, you know, the capital share is uh, mm -hmm. at least constant across steps. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, in the order of 50 to 60%, which kind of like, you know, was meaningful. Uh, so let's put it this way, like, you know, nothing kind of like, you know, jump to the eyes as like, yeah. oh, Cobb Douglas is terrible. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but then at the same time, it also like, you know, really helps us like with flexibility and making like, you know, everything kind of like analytical yeah. up to like, you know, once you have a fresh shock. And so that's, uh, that, that's a little bit of a like bad justification, frankly. But we can, uh, we can, we can think more about it because, you know, I'm, I'm with you, of course, it's gonna matter. Like, yeah. that's. That's what I think. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, and, and, and we could do it. Yeah, honestly, we could do it. And, uh, and yeah. it's something that we haven't explored. I think that, yeah, locations would be one thing. I guess another thing could also be, but maybe I'm not sure how model determined the, the, the maybe the c imputed capital cost for you are also backed out from the Cobb Douglas, or do you have any independent evidence on the capital cost? Because if you have an independent evidence of the capital cost, then of course that could also be used to sort of look at um, if you have Yeah, variation. so no, the, the, so this is important. And you know, of course I just skimmed through it. So then the, the rental market price, uh, that mm -hmm. one uh, we observe it directly. Yeah. So that one we observe it directly. So then, and then essentially then what we do it is that we kind of like, you know, given the rental market price that we observe, we find uh, uh, kind of like, you know, cost of purchasing capital because we also observe how costly are the machines. But what yep. we don't observe it is essentially like, you know, the, the average uh, cost of capital. And so yep. then what we do it is that, you know, in order to, to get a market clearing where you hit the observed prices uh, of mm -hmm. renting and the observed pricing of like, you know, purchase, uh, that mm -hmm. is what, like, you know, recovers the, um, the cost of capital. And by the way, the cost of capital is extremely large, kind of like, you know, as expected, but then the cost of capital for conditional on firms uh, um, buying the machine is not that crazy. It is like, you know, mm -hmm. along like, you know, 40, 50% per year, which is kind of like, you know, line with, uh, um, mm -hmm. with what we think is the cost of capital in this, in this setting. Um, so, yeah, and, I, and again, I, I agree, like, you know, using more like a, a variation across space, it's something that honestly, like, you know, we can do it, you know, somehow like you can only do like so much in one paper. Yeah. And we have like, you know, something like a, a hundred <laughs> tables and figures, but it's something, you know, again, I'm, I'm very happy to do it. And like, you know, hopefully here we start in like an agenda. So I want to really learn how this, uh, this works and uh, definitely not do that. It's a great suggestion. Thanks so much. Uh uh, we're going to jump right to our, our, our next paper, which is uh, uh, Tristan, Tristan Reed. Thanks, everyone, Thanks. for Thanks. comments and attention.